Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adrienne Gilliard here with Sandra Bazan, and we are from ELC's Inclusion Team, bringing you Behavior Bites tidbits. Our tidbit topic for today is Gentle Parenting Part 2. A few weeks ago, Sandy and I talked about gentle parenting and how its approach is, focuses on empathy, understanding, and respect for a child's emotions in their developmental stages. Um, while setting clear boundaries and expectations. Yeah. So that segment was great. We loved it, but we felt we needed to come back and give you some strategies to go along with that previous information because it's very much needed when we're talking about general parenting. So the first strategy that we have is setting a clear expectation for your child. Clearly communicating what your expectations are for the behavior and making sure that they understand what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So Sandy, what does that look like? So, yeah, I mean, when we say we think we're clear, right, when when we're talking to our children, whether at home or in the classroom, we 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 think we are we were um, explicit in our expectations, but we're not. Right. So when we say to our children at drop off, be good. Well, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Behave. I was clear. What does it look like in the classroom when I hear teachers say sit properly? Well, what does that look like exactly, right? So, the, and it's a nuance in, in the way that we use our own language and our own words, right? So I would probably say, ooh, I love the way you're sitting, Adrian. Look, Adrian is sitting crisscross applesauce. Her eyes are on me. Her, She has her listening ears on. And look, her mouth is quiet. She has quiet hands and quiet feet. I love the way you're sitting, Adrian. Clear expectations. Right. I'm right. clear. I'm defining it. I'm being I'm able to almost um, define the behavior that I want to see in, in its physicality. Right. So that's that's our first um, strategy. What's the second? All right. We came so up. the second one is using positive reinforcement. And I know a lot of times that gets a little bit, you know, people get a little bit, you know, turned away by that one. But when we talk about positive reinforcement, that's when you praise and reward your children when they exhibit those desirable behaviors that we want to see. This can be in the form of a verbal praise, the hug, sticker. What else can it look like, Sandy? You know, and again, I mean, I'm going to go back to being very explicit and being uh -huh. very clear. So when I'm giving positive reinforcement, I want that child to know exactly what it is that made me happy. Right. Uh -huh. So saying, oh, that was a good job. Well, uh -huh. what about it was a good job. I love the way that you were focused. I love the way that you kept your body quiet. You know, being very, very specific, number one. And then number two, I know that a lot of there's a lot of like ah uh, about the positive reinforcement but a lot, of a lot of pushback but let's be real as adults none of us go to work for free we get positively reinforced with our paychecks right Absolutely. and so i'm not saying that we're we're buying our our little friends right we're not but we are providing incentives what why should they want to what what and what what motivates them? And for some kids, it it can be tangibles. Mm -hmm. For others, it's as simple as a thumbs up, a wink, a pat on the back, a big hug, a whisper in the ear. I'm so proud of you. Right. You did it. So mm -hmm. proud. Of you, right. It, a picture. Ooh, let me picture of that. That's a positive reinforcement, right? Especially for a kid who's you know who's who's craving that attention. For his teacher to say, I love what you built. That was amazing. Let's stop. Let me take a picture. I love that you didn't tumble or you didn't break the, you know, like we're talking about some behaviors, right? So what are we, we need to be explicit in what we are looking for and then shower and, and generously and yes. explicitly provide that positive reinforcement in whatever way works for that particular individualized student or child at Right. Okay. And so the third um, strategy that we have is providing logical consequences. So when a child misbehaves, we have to implement consequences that are logical and related to that behavior. For example, if they don't clean up their toys, they might lose the privilege to play with them. But Sandy always has like a, a good way to, to provide those logical consequences. Sandy, what can that look like in the classroom and at home? So first of all, I think that we, as the adults in the room, we need to check ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We get sucked in to these 
battles back and forth and then out of our mouths fly you're never playing with any toys you're never watching you know we have to be very very careful in in what flies out of our mouths when we ourselves are triggered right so this is taking into account we've taken our deep breath and we've looked at the child <laughs> and we have to understand that we're not punishing Right? That's not the point of it. The point is to teach a consequence that makes them kind of think twice of, you know what? I didn't like that consequence. I have a choice. But when I made that choice, this happened. And I, that wasn't my favorite. Right? And so making sure that when we are thinking about the consequences, they make sense. They're not extreme. They're not punitive. They're not, they're not reactive. Right? Because as the adults, both in the classroom and at home, we know our kids. We know what they're gonna, what what boundaries they're going to try to push. Let's be proactive and ahead of time come up with a consequence. So in the moment, we're not being run on feelings and our own negative emotions. It might be a chart. Oh, you didn't clean up. Oh, that means go to the chart. Go, go mm -hmm. to the go to the visual. You didn't clean up. Oh, honey. Oh, that that's the choice you made. Okay, let's see. When you don't clean up, then and it's right there, right? So mm -hmm. that's one way to do it. Um, and and you're not the bad guy. You and I think this goes into the next one. The next one is modeling good behavior, okay. and it's showing that kindness, that empathy, and the patience that you know that we want to see them do. So Absolutely. we need to model that behavior. Absolutely. And so what better way to model it than to come together and be a team? So if I'm having a child who has a real hard time with, you know, um, cleaning up, I might ask them, well, what do you think you should do? What, what, what should the consequence be if you don't clean up? See what they come up with. Right. And then model what it is that I want to see when I am triggered, because I will be triggered. We're people. Right. Parents are people. <laughs> Parents are people, too. Um, teachers are people. <laughs> we have our good days, we have our bad days, but taking those moments and making them um, teachable moments. You know, I always talk about, you know, throwing, being a drama queen in the classroom. And, mm -hmm. and, and, yes. and, and I mean, I used to go into the classroom and throw a fit on purpose, but so that I could model what it is that I wanted them to see to do when they were frustrated. How do they know what frustration is unless they've seen it? They cannot, you know, it, it's very difficult for kids to kind of um, label their own feelings, but it's real easy for them to label somebody else's feeling. Right? They, can, they, can tell, they can tell you what they saw. They mm -hmm. might not be able to tell you what they feel, but they can tell you what they saw. Yes. Right? And so definitely modeling, making those opportunities within the classroom that you have, that you and you make it memorable. Mm -hmm. Make it so that you are falling out. Maybe you do throw a tantrum as a teacher. Maybe mom, you get really, really frustrated and you, and, and you act the way that your child, you've seen your child act. Maybe you sit and you throw a tantrum on the floor. I bet you, you get their attention. What you do with that attention next, that's the key. That's the, that's key. the key, right? Right. And you said something a little while ago in that strategy that leads directly into this one. It's encouraging problem solving. You know, when you talked about the consequences. So you involve those children in the problem solving discussions, help them think through the consequences of their actions. And you come up with those solutions to resolve those conflicts. Right. Absolutely. And sometimes when you ask the child, you know, like, what do you think you can do next time? They might not know. And so at that point, at that point, that's when I'm providing that scaffolding, right? So I'm providing, right. well, what do you think? What if, you know, I wonder what would happen if next time that I wonder what would happen if, if you use that as a, as a caveat to every, to, to all those, um, problem solving conflict, like initiation probing questions, they open up. They're like, Oh, you know? Um, and, and, and really, really pull out of them what they think they should do or right. do next, do better next time. Who can they, who can they ask? What words can they use? You know, mm -hmm. and, and really taking the moment to, to provide that skill in the moment. Right. So this is, we've talked about this in another tidbit. This is that pushing part. This is that reconnection part which leads right into the next strategy that push in instead of time out 
mm -hmm. time in. So Absolutely. that is, yes, that is our sixth strategy. You know, instead of isolating the children, sit with them, discuss that behavior. You know, and, and we need to be clear about it. I don't know how many of us has, have ever tried to have a rational conversation <laughs> with a tantruming three, four, five-year-old. It's not happening, right? We know this to it's be over true. at that point, it's, right. It's done, it's done, it is done. Hopefully, um, they're riding the wave of, <laughs> and they're on the downward spiral. And once they're, once they have, remember, because we have already taught them these skills, mm -hmm. right? We've, we've already given them these skills when they haven't been escalated. So we might have a visual in a, a, a special area in the room, in our living room, in our, in their bedroom, in our classrooms. We might have a visual. And you remember the one with the remote control? I want you to I think. Do. You yes. know, maybe maybe you think the way that you're changing. What can oh we have a toolkit because we 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 did that together when we were all happy and we talked about what happens to you when you don't get your way. And so I understand that you need to take a break because you're frustrated that you didn't get your way. Here's your toolkit that we created together, mm -hmm. right? Strategy number one. Here it is. Let me know when you're ready. And the second, Adrian, that I hear the that sign of, okay, or the sign that, okay, fine, I'm just, I'm, they might be mad, but they're going through their toolkit, I might shuffle on over. And now I'm starting to push in. Right. And yeah, I, that would have made me upset too. Like, I totally saw what happened and I get it. I get that you didn't want to. I love the way that you're using this. Do you need a hug? What can we do next time? Do you see the difference? <laughs> There's, you know, Perfect I mean, push in, right? But, but but allowing for them to ride the wave, you have mm -hmm. to, you know, those of us that are want the that magic, no tantrum ever. It's not. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. That's not gonna happen. But it's those tantrums that give us those teachable moments. It's in those moments of dysregulation that we 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 kind of usher them through and help them regulate and then give them those remind them of the skills that we taught, right? But it's that reminder and it's that cycle. It's gonna happen often for some kids. <laughs> some kids, it's a one-time deal and it's and it's it's a wrap and then some kids just need that practice right right so, right. so push, push in and so for number eight when they are in that moment of dysregulation it's important for us to stay calm so that is our strategy is to stay calm you know um instead of you know, getting to the level that they are, we have to remain calm, we have to remain composed. And when we're angry and we're yelling, you know, that hinders effective communication anyway. So they're already here at their peak and then we go to the peak as well. That that doesn't help that situation. Absolutely, and then just think about it um, from, from the other side. We just told them, we want them, we want to mirror the behaviors we want to see. If I am showing them I talk a good game when you're angry. I want you to act like this. But when I'm angry, uh -huh. this is how I behave. You know, children <laughs> children are great about um, putting your weaknesses out to blast. Like they will show you <laughs> where you are not absolutely where you are not consistent, right? Mm -hmm. And and they they will they will they will do what you do, not what you said. And right. it is very humbling when they do that because we get to see, okay, well, I just told him not to do it and here I am. <laughs> and here I am, right? So definitely flip yourselves. Definitely take that moment. And again, let that be a teachable moment. And you can actually say to your child at home, to your students in the classroom, you can actually say, you know what? I'm going to go take a break. I need to go take two breaths and then I will be right back. Mm -hmm. And that is a phenomenal way to do two things. Turn around kind of catch your breath and regulate yourself and model exactly what it is like I'm and and set those clear boundaries I'm not going to allow for you to pull me into this mm -hmm. maintaining control maintaining that you know um safety because we are their safety they are only as safe as they are with us when we are dysregulated so for as long as I can remain calm even in my most dysregulated my children, my students, and everybody around me feels safer. Right. Right? That takes a lot. 
It does. <laughs> that takes a lot of self-reflection and a lot of kind of practice. Mm-hmm. The same. It does. It, 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 it's, it, we're asking from the kids what, we're, what we should be asking from ourselves as adults, both in the classroom and at home. Yes. Now, initially I said that was um, strategy number eight, but that's actually strategy number seven, staying calm. But number eight, our eighth strategy is offering choices. So we give those children choices whenever po um, possible so that it encourages um, and empowers autonomy. So for instance, if you know you got your kids sitting at the lunch table, and instead of demanding that they eat all of the vegetables on their plate, you said, well, would you like the carrots or would you like the broccoli? And Sandy, what well, else does and, this look and like? like? And that is quintessential gentle parenting in my, yes. and where I come from, right? I don't know about you. Growing <laughs> up in my house, <laughs> there were no options. You know, my mother was a God bless her, you know, like, because I said so. That was the, ex that was the That's extent. It. And if she had to even say that, you know what that that was that so now we're talking about gentle parenting and we're talking about really looking into the souls of our children and and recognizing them as human beings who mm -hmm. who have preferences right that does not mean <laughs> that they get a free pass to do whatever mm -hmm. it is that they want to do or not do right we are still raising our children to be functioning people in this society in this community and 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 they have sometimes they're going to have to do things that they don't want i have to do things adrian you we all have to do certain things that we don't necessarily want to do but need to laundry being one of them right for me <laughs> that's me that's it that's where, where my brain is okay that being said empowering them and providing that opportunity for them to give make a choice how much more respectful is that you know what i'm i am truly respecting somebody when i am offering them an option not of whether or not they're going to do something but which one would you rather which one do? would you prefer mm -hmm. right so if and again it's that little nuance it's that little tweak in, in the way that you present things but that's key that is so key to being to to gentle being gentle with not only our, our students, but everybody really in, in our in our lives, right? Nobody wants to be told what to do every minute of their day. Give them back some of that power. Give them back some of that autonomy, like you said. Give them back and then stand back and see what they choose and mm -hmm. honor it and really start to learn and, and, and get to know the individual, right? So that was number what? That was number eight. Okay. So number nine is what we talk about all the time. Be consistent. Consistency is key in any kind of positive discipline. It doesn't matter what model it is. Be consistent and make sure that you enforce the rules and the consequences consistently so that children do know what to expect. Right? You can't play a game if the rules keep changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, that's a, yeah. <laughs> that's it's hard to play a game if every time I thought this was the, wasn't this the rule. This isn't the rule. Okay, so it's very difficult, right? And so kids, though they may fight you on it, through love, desire, need. Actually, a lot of their behaviors are begging for that structure. Right. A lot of us are. A lot of our children just need to know what happens next. And if I don't do that, what are the consequences? Good, let me make a choice, mm -hmm. right? And so being consistent, not only in structure, routine, procedures, policies in, in the classroom, at home, but also with the consequences like we talked about before. Like every time you don't clean up, oh, what was that again? Let's go back to the chart because the chart's mm -hmm. not gonna change. It says that when you mm -hmm. don't, you have to, whatever it is that you guys came up with together. But definitely consistency. And and I, I'll add consistency in my in me as the adult. Mm -hmm. right? We have to control our moody, our, our, our moods within the classroom, right? We have a lot going on outside of the classrooms and moms, dads, we have a lot going outside on so many different parts of our worlds. When it comes to dealing with our children, 
especially when we're attempting to gentle parent, we need to be gentle with ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And so maybe take a moment to take a deep breath and kind of say, okay, am I, am I being reactive because of something that happened outside or, you know, like really taking the time to be gentle across the board, not only with your kids, but with yourself as well before, you know, trying to gently parent because that'll rattle you. <laughs> that will. You. You know, it will. It'll, it'll, it'll definitely push a button or two. All right. And number 10, our final strategy is to practice active listening. You know, Sandy, a minute ago, you said honoring the children's choices. And this is the time to listen to your children's perspectives and their feelings and honor those feelings. Um, validate their their emotions, show empathy, even if you don't agree with them, you know? <laughs> so in my brain, all of a sudden, I don't know why I thought of I couldn't get the for breakfast, right? And that's a huge deal. Uh -huh. that, not being able to get a cookie for breakfast or whatever it is, right? For a three-year-old, as an adult, you're looking at them like, it's not that big it's of not a even deal. Big, yeah, but it it's is. Huge. To you as a 30, 40, 50, 20, whatever year old you are, maybe not, but to the perspective of a three-year-old, to the, in the perspective of an 18-month-old, in, in, in the little perspective of those people that we, because they're, they're whole people with different perspectives. And until we don't honor that perspective, it's not a big deal to you, Adrian, but it is to that kid. So how do we empathize and say, I know it's really hard when you don't get what you want. How can I make it better? You can have a cookie for dessert. Which cookie do you want for dessert? Rather than get over it. Why are you crying? It's just a cookie. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work. That's not honoring. That's not empathizing. That's, that's not um, respecting. And that's what it comes down to. Bottom line, it's it's about it's about respecting these children as as the people, as the individuals that they are, and mm -hmm. and and honoring the fact that they have voices, thoughts, feelings, emotions, preferences, um, and we're just here to kind of maneuver and guide, right? And so and and while we celebrate the nuances of, of each individual, whether they're in your own children, because I've got three and all three are different, <laughs> or in a classroom of 15. Right. So that's what I got for you. Okay. So, <laughs> and all of these strategies that we discussed, you know, they're focusing on encouragement, rapport, problem solving, teaching those valuable life skills that children are going to need, you know, but it's also important for us as adults to adjust our expectations as it relates to our little kids, mm -hmm. you know, the stages of development that they're in and also learn our own triggers mm -hmm. and when we need to take a break from those situations, you know, and then model and model, model, and model. model. Absolutely. So if you are experiencing challenging behaviors with any of your children in your classroom, you can always reach out to Debbie Kay on our warm line where her number is 954-295-0672. We'd like to encourage you to connect with us on Behavior Bites Zoom that is held every Friday from one until two. You can speak to your director about registration. And if you found this tidbit and others about helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. Take care.